we realized not only the value of being outside because we were restricted during the pandemic, but also um, the value when you are outside of, of how it makes you feel. And I think people had time to concentrate and time to connect. And I think one of the most wonderful things we can all do to um, honor the landscape is just to connect with it, is to go outside. And even if you're just spending time listening to the birds and realizing they're there. In this week's episode, I interview Marion Boswell. Marion is a landscape architect based in Kent. She specialises in landscape design for historic places, but she's also very, very conscious of sustainability and looking after the land. And she actually has done a TEDx talk all about it. We talk about that in my interview. Uh, we start off with her sharing her career journey, how she didn't start off in the gardening world. And she talks about her career and then the transformation to her current practice where she works together with nine other people. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Welcome, Marion, to the My Small Business and Me podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to see you again. And you, and you. So we met several years ago now at a retreat, and we instantly had a passion for flowers and gardens, and that's how I think we sort of started to chat. So could you start off the interview, Marion, with telling people about your career story, please? Yes. So I um, started off on a fairly traditional path. I studied um, art at A-level and would have quite liked to go to uh, art school, but being academic, I sort of followed that path instead and studied French and Italian at Oxford. And from there, I went to be a buyer, um, an interiors buyer. And from there, I was headhunted to be a management consultant because of my languages. That was a wonderful job, but it was, I had friends who had, if I tell you that they had a day nanny, a night nanny, and a weekend nanny, they kind of subcontracted their whole life because it was very high pressure. And it was in the 1980s when management consultancy was kind of the big new thing. And I slightly, well, I slightly catapulted out of that. Um, um, unfortunately, I had a, a child who was born early and who died. And I think it was probably oh the result of working so incredibly hard. So then I thought, well, I don't want to subcontract my whole life anymore. Obviously, to begin with, I didn't think that doing it, I was a bit flawed. But then I, th I thought, right, don't want to subcontract my whole life. What shall I do? So I am um, concentrated on being a mother for a little bit. And in that time, we moved to Kent and took on this large garden. And so I needed to learn how to look after it. And being slightly academic, I studied everything. I studied horticulture and garden history and garden design and ended up doing um, a master's in landscape architecture. And having done that, people kept asking me to do their gardens and sort of gradually I thought, well, I okay, I will, but I need to know what, what I'm doing. So I did the masters and then um, I surrounded myself with good people and set up like that. So yes, that in a potted nutshell <laughs> is, is how I came to be a career It's all because of your move. Yes. Yeah. So were your family into gardening before? My grandmother gardened. I gardened with my grandmother when I was little and I always had a garden in London. So when other people were cycling, um, you know, going to the gym or something, I would get up at six and tend my garden and then go to work. So yes, I always had a garden, always loved it. And we traveled a lot when I was young. So I spent a lot of time in Italy and loved the Italian gardens um, and studied Italian. So yes, it's, it's kind of in the blood, but gardening with my grandmother felt like home. So if I'm in the garden, I kind of have that feeling of being surrounded by love and interest and, I think all of us have something deep inside us, don't, don't we, that somewhere that just feels like home. And for me, that's in a garden. 
Yeah, I remember my grandmother was into gardening as well. And I remember her, we've got a photo of her just stood with, um, she'd obviously been out pruning it, her roses in the garden. Probably the casualties of my cousins playing football. <laughs> Lovely. And she would, yeah, we'd always sort of, when I was a little baby, she'd carry me around the garden and show me the flowers. Oh, memories. Nice, um, yes. Yeah, so I have noticed a bit of a trend with all my podcast, well, most of my podcast guests, and that's a career change. And so how many years ago was your career change? Oh, well, it would be 20 something. Yeah. Wow, wow. And did you get any reaction from your friends and colleagues as to how you were going from such a, a corporate role to something much more hands on? No, not at all. No, I think people were fascinated. Well, mostly yeah, they wanted me to come and help them. <laughs> but I do remember a lovely moment when I was working with Jeanette, um, who I worked with for many years and she and I were planting up a garden outside a boardroom on Bond Street and it was a, a small roof um, garden but in very prime location and she had also changed careers and had been you know, used to being inside the boardroom as had I and there was this one moment when they started coming in to have a board meeting and she and I sort of looked up and met eyes and we just laughed because of course you know which side of the of the uh, glass would you rather be <laughs> so we, we were happy with our decision oh so when you first set up your business there was how many people you and were you on your own for a little while or um i was on my own but then i um hired some super people from from greenwich so i studied at greenwich and then i was invited to go back and teach at greenwich so when i was teaching at greenwich the lovely thing about that is that the super talented people um, come across your path. And if you're lucky enough to entice them to come and work with you, then you soon build up a really good team. So yeah, I've worked with some really talented people. Um, and uh, I don't want to do too much of a spoiler, but that would be one of my, my tips. <laughs> good people. Yeah. So when you started, did you have a vision of so many years later now employing a staff of nine people? No, I didn't really. I did at some time along the way, I did some maths to work out how many people I would need in order to have enough turnover to pay everybody. Because, of course, it's not all about flowers. Sadly, design is um, lots of it is, is nuts and bolts and paying other people's mortgages and your own costs and all the rest of it. So I did do some maths along the way and decided um, how many people we would need eventually. Um, in order to get to a critical mass, really, so that you can um, have enough um, in the bank for, for rainy days and tricky days, yeah. So when you meet people for the first time now, how do you describe what your current role is? So I say I'm a landscape architect. I mean, I'm happy to say I'm a gardener as well. I started off, obviously, with a horticulture background. Um, and everybody that works with me is also a landscape architect. So I'm a fellow of the Landscape Institute, actually, um, not, not long since I was made one last year. Um, and the thing about being a landscape architect is that there's a code of practice. So it's a bit like being a surveyor, um, you're, you're chartered. Um, oh my, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah, so it's, um, it's not easy to, well, it's, it's a lot of work. So it takes several years to become chartered. Um, and it just means that you can confidently deal with scale and with uh, tricky bits and as well as the planting. So the people that I work with are also um, qualified in horticulture because it's important to have the two. Sometimes you have landscape architects who are just about hard landscape and maybe they're town planner types. And then sometimes you have horticulturists and we, we try to meld the two um, because it's a huge discipline. That's the great thing about it is a career you could never get bored there's so much to learn so what sort of projects do you work on now when you when somebody employs a landscape architect what kind of work can they expect to to get well we do at the moment we've got some lovely projects on we're doing two um boutique hotels one wow. is the giraffe hall hotel down at port limb 
where uh, the giraffes are going to come up to this beautiful old, um, it was the French house, it was called a uh, 17th century house. Um, and people will be able to feed the giraffes as they come up to the house. So that's really special. We're doing a uh, um, historic house down in Hampshire, which is becoming a hotel, which was, is a Gertrude Jekyll listed garden. So that's very lovely. So that's a historic house. Um, we're doing some big estates, but we also do small things. We do, um, we do some London gardens. Um, we're doing a lovely house down in Itchener. So yes, all sorts of different things really um, keep it interesting. So when you look back on the last 20 years or, or however many years you've been running your business now, are there any particular projects that stand out in your memory? Yes, oh, lots. Uh, well, do you know, one of them I really enjoyed was the, um, which was a pro bono job actually, was the Blackthorn Trust. So we always have something pro bono running as part of our kind of ethos. And that was a healing garden for the wonderful place in, in Maidstone, in the walls, uh, walls of the old mental hospital, actually. Um, and it's a place where people can go who have long term pain or um, actually they also treat people with diabetes. Um, and it's just the most incredible place run on the um, principles of Rudolf Steiner. And there we did a physic garden, uh, which is all using uh, healing herbs. So that was a, a challenge and something incredibly satisfying and nurturing. So we're really pleased to, to work with them. And really it's changed people's lives and they're so lovely about saying how it's changed their lives. And it's a super place for us to go. So I take my team back as well and we join in things like Candlemas. They, they, they mark all the different seasons and we, we join in and um, you get as much healing as you give there. It's, it's a magical place. It's, it's funny that word healing comes up because that's something which is very apparent when you look at your website, how your, your description of what you do is not just about the landscape, it's thinking more also about looking after the landscape, wouldn't you say? Okay. Um, very much, yes. Um, it's about listening to the land and to what the land needs, I think. And that is uh, something which all of my team are really um, on board with. And we sing very much from the same hymn sheet, if you like. Um, and it's, it has been a real privilege really to work with clients who feel the same way and to really instigate sustainable principles, but uh, not just physically stay sustainable, but um, um, mentally and um, spiritually sustainable as well, things which are going to help people to live happier lives. Do you feel that since the pandemic there's been a renewed interest in garden design and landscapes? Definitely and I know everybody is uh, run off their feet. <laughs> We've had so many, I mean it's lovely, it's a lovely position to be in um, but we have an, an awful lot of inquiries at the moment for, for work and we're thrilled to that people are so interested in their gardens but I think that we all just realized well we realized not only the value of being outside because we were restricted during the pandemic but also um, the value when you are outside of, of how it makes you feel and I think people had time to concentrate and time to connect and I think one of the most wonderful things we can all do to um, honor the landscape is just to connect with it, is to go outside. And even if you're just spending time listening to the birds and realizing they're there. I was reading a lovely uh, book, Peter Wallenburn's new book. I think it's The Breath of Trees. He wrote The Hidden Life of Trees. And he was saying recently that um, just by connecting, by noticing something, already we've done some good and already we've, um, helped uh, foster that way of living together with the planet and I think that's what people were doing in the pandemic and it's wonderful that it's carried on um, as lockdown is loosening up. Yeah absolutely and what do you think people get from that immersion in, in nature? What, what is it do you think that nature is able to give people? 
Well, I think on a sort of scientific and hormonal point of view, then you'd say that the endorphins are lifted and you feel better and the serotonin um, and you know, those sorts of measurable physical things. But um, I don't think that everything we feel has to be measured. And I think that when you're fully immersed in nature, you can feel that you are something, that you're a small part of something much bigger and that we are all connected and that we can trust in something much bigger than us that um, is a force for good. And that brings me very nicely onto your TED talk, which you did um, in 2020, which is all about um, how we treat our gardens is how we treat the earth. What prompted you to go and create a TED talk and, and be on stage? <laughs> yeah, you may well ask. <laughs> it, was, it was quite a tough gig, I tell you. Yeah, sure. There were hundreds of people in the audience. There were thousands, actually. There was, well, I think there was one and a half thousand or something. But yes, um, so I have a lovely friend called Sarah Salway, who is a poet and a novelist. She gave a TED talk uh, the year before. And during that, there was a slot for a one minute speech. And I was working with the Black Corn Trust at the time and they needed funds. And I was saying to myself, you know, when they said, and will someone, you know, five people can come up and speak for a minute. And there's little sort of, gremlin on my shoulder was saying it's Saturday Marin you absolutely do not have to go up there you've come as a spectator why do you always have to blah, blah. and then the person on my other shoulder was saying but there's a thousand people out there and they might some of them might have money that they want to give to the Black Corn Trust and when are you next going to have a thousand people in front of you? so I did, but cut a long story short I didn't actually mean totally to get picked but I did happen to walk past the lady who was picking and she caught my eye and and I was the fifth person she said okay one two three four five and looked at me and I thought okay so I stood up for the one minute and having spoken for the one minute they then said the next year would you like to apply I still had to go through a massive um a very rigorous way of what is it, what's it called selection process to speak but they did say would you like to apply to speak for the TED talk the next year and I just felt really strongly that something needed to be said to link gardens with how we treat both ourselves and the earth and um, funnily enough just after my TED talk, Sue Stewart Smith brought out her book. And if I think if I'd read her book before the TED talk, I might not have bothered because she says it really well. <laughs> but and I, I did laugh about that with her at the time. But I, at New Year that year, just before the TED talk, I had gone to Guatemala and had experienced the beautiful but very disturbing sights of those entire that entire civilization that was wiped out. And it's wiped, it was wiped out through um, deforestation and drought and disease. And in my, it was a TEDx talk, not a TED talk, but in the talk, I left out the word disease because I didn't want to be alarmist in February, 2020, you know, a no. month before. I thought, oh, I went not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I say disease? But voila, yes. Oh so so um, I did the talk and I would recommend anyone to do it because it's an incredibly good way of crystallizing what your own ideas are, uh, but it's jolly difficult and they, they are very rigorous in what they do and don't allow you to say. Everything has to be scientifically proven. Nothing can be just a bit of woo, which um, I like a bit of woo, so that was quite tricky. <laughs> a bit of woo. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk, Marion, please, about your Instagram account, which is absolutely stunning. The images are so beautiful. And I love how you very often use quotes from literature, I can't speak, literature. Um, tell us more about how you're using that as a marketing tool. Well, I think you have to remember that I came to ask you about it once upon a time. Uh, when we met, um, I had no idea how to use it. And 
I came and, and spoke to you and you were very kind in, in sorting out what you say for your strap line, I think, and um, putting all your colours in a grid, which actually I don't now do, because I think that my followers, well, maybe I'd have very many more if I did, who knows, but <laughs> <laughs> I've just, I've now just say things which is a bit more spontaneous, so things mm. from the heart. And I no longer um, do it all carefully on a on a layout plan, but I suppose uh, I do try and make sure that I have some far distant views as well as some close ups, and so I mix it up a bit. But it's more really about connecting with what I want to say, and I can't tell you how special it's been um, for me to get feedback from people and to meet people and to here because you sort of put these things out in the ether really for your own benefit I mean I just say it for me um and then people come and say how much it's made a huge difference to them but sometimes I think we all feel a, a great response so to, to events and and often it seems like we're almost like a choir there's sort of like a linking of hands in of people who are trying to spread light I suppose spread happiness spread I don't know what it is but just trying to connect with one another and there's a whole group of people on Instagram who are so who are spreading goodness and I think it's kindness and people have been so incredibly kind to me and so I have I also have a, a studio Instagram account in which we talk about what we're up to and have images of, of gardens we're doing and so on um, and actually, I've asked one of my team to help me with that because that tends to get a little bit left behind um, as I'm much more interested in talking about the, the sort of ideas behind how we want to live and how we want to live more sustainably. So that's kind of what it's all about. Yeah. And you started doing lots of reels recently as well. I have started doing lots of reels because um, the um, well, this is a sort of Instagram chat, but the hashtags seem to have stopped working. So I've found that um, I, I get very, very, uh, you know, rather than sometimes I would get sort of 50,000 people to look at something and now it looks like it's sort of 2,000. And so it was in a, well, to begin with, I thought, well, maybe Instagram wants us to do reels, but actually I really enjoy them because they, um, it's just a lovely tiny sort of little slice of life. So they're very short and just a little thought. I, I don't know, I don't know, do you use them? I just really enjoy them. I have started doing them just because you should always try and do what Instagram's new features are because that's what they're pushing the most. And um, so, yeah, I have started doing some, not anywhere near as many as yours. I think it helps you've got, you're outside, you've got great light most of the time, haven't you? And um, yeah, so carry on doing them is what I would say, definitely. Well, thank you. Well, actually it's more that I'm, doing them because I've got great light because I love to walk first thing in the morning and, and late at night those are my favorite times to walk and often the light is just amazing and I just want to share it it's like wow look at this <laughs> yeah you're choosing the golden hour and yeah the hour after sunrise mm -hmm. and the hour was it after sunrise and the hour before sunset yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so beautiful my oh. favorite times of day but what I really love is that even on your, not even, but on your website and on your Instagram, you're extremely particular in the images that you do share online. Uh, it, have you got a passion for photography or is that just something that's really innate in you and, and, and you're just very, because of the job you do and your artist background? I love photography. I mean, I'm not very good at it, um, but I, most of it's actually on an iPhone these days. I do, do have a beautiful Canon 50, but depressingly, I always found that the automatic um, button did it much better than anything else I was trying to do. So I do use it now and then, but mostly it's yeah, mostly it's uh, just on my phone. But yeah, I just think you've got a really, really good eye as to what, obviously from, you know, what your, your actual, being a landscape architect, that's all intertwined, I'm assuming, because you have to visualise what things are going to look like from a plan. I hope so. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, we do have to visualise a lot and draw a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Wow, yeah, I, it's one of the most beautiful gardening accounts that I follow. And oh, Rona, that's it. I mean it. 
thank you. And thank you for your help right at the beginning, which was wonderful. Oh, very welcome. Very welcome. And you've got so many people um, following you and doing that now. And also, you see, I've got, I've sent florist friends to you who are thank now doing you. very well with their accounts, which is nice thank to see you. you. Thank you. So how are the next few months of 2021 looking for you, Marion? Uh, well, they are looking very busy. We've got some wonderful new clients, very exciting clients, which I can't talk about yet, but I can't <laughs> wait when I can talk about them. Um, and we also have, yes, we've got some nice work on. We're doing a, a courtyard for the Conquest Hospital. That's our next kind of pro bono piece of work, which is really lovely because that, I don't know if you, well, you, I'm sure you've never been to the Conquest, but it, it's in Hastings and they, built it around a series of courtyards, which was a lovely idea, but quite a few of them are now a little down at heel. So um, some super people have clubbed together to pay for some of those to be renovated. So that's a lovely mm. piece of work. Um, and yes, um, I'm finishing off the, this book, which is coming out next year, which I can tell you a bit more about another time. And yeah, loads of really lovely projects and, and we're, I'm really lucky. I have a super team and I'm really enjoying working with them. Um, so yeah, we're having a lovely time. Are they all back in the office now? Today is the first day, which is why you and I were having a slight internet <laughs> issue and I've come to work here so in, my, in the house in the garden room. Today's the first day when we have four of us back because we've got a specific project that we're working on together. And I think we will carry on with quite a bit of remote working as well as in the studio because it suits people to do both. Yeah, and they, you know, my husband's found that it's very easy to be more productive sometimes when you're on your own because you don't have any distractions and you can have real like deep thinking time. And I think we want to keep that balance. And also people have other lives. Sometimes people have children and it's easier to collect and drop them off and so on. And one of the things, having been a management consultant before, one of the things I really wanted to do setting up this practice was to make it responsive to the way that we want to live and to make work work for us. Mm, really good point. So with regard to, before we go on to your three tips, Marianne, if somebody is inspired to add something to their garden or they don't have a garden, they've got a balcony or a patio or a window box, what sort of plants would you advise that they rush out to get? the next month or so to sort of bring a bit of happiness to their lives? Well, I would start off with um, herbs, things that you can smell and that you can eat and that um, will change your lives as well as being great for pollinators. So, I mean, even start with lavender. Lavender is a wonderful healing herb. Um, it's you know great for if you put it by your pillow, it's great anti um, moths in your bar in your clothes, but also it's um, it's a wonderful um, pollinating plant in the garden. So the bees love it. So that's a very simple thing. Or um, basil that you can eat. A pot of basil even on your windows is a, is a lovely thing, and you can. Um, it's very good for the mind, the memory. If you've got children doing exams, it's very good for for them to have basil. Or if you're doing exams yourself. Um, and just to rub it between your hands makes you um, sort of think about holidays and tomato salads. Of course, tomatoes are another great thing. Um, so yes, I would look at just little herbs and things which you can eat. And then if you're going to, if perhaps you've got some plants, the next thing I would say would be to add water. So even if it's just a big dish of water that will bring in animals to drink, so it could be a big dish which you just fill up every few days and let run off. Then you'll bring in the birds, you'll bring in bees if you've got a little edge to drink from. And you also uh, will just reflect the light. If you, even if you put a little bowl of water on a, on a balcony, you'll get the, all the play of light and movement into the, into the windows. So yeah, that's the second thing I would probably bring in. 
And you've totally inspired me. I'm thinking, what can I use that we've got in the house <laughs> I can use in the garden? Because my husband keeps on saying we should get a, a, a bird bath, but um, we just haven't got around to it. So I'm going, as soon as we finish this call, I'm going to go and hunt for something to put water in in our garden. Perfect. And just empty it in the winter if it's if it will break in the frost. Good um, point. Yes. But other than that, perfect. Yeah, good. Thank you. I'm so pleased. <laughs> And I should get some herbs as well. So <laughs> <laughs> let's move on to your three tips, please, Marion. Yes. So my three tips, I was glad that you emailed me beforehand. And I was thinking about this on my walk uh, this morning. What would my three tips be? And I think the first tip would be to decide why you're doing what you're doing. And I think that works whether you're a florist or a bookbinder or a teacher or... Um, you know, an earring maker or whatever, or particularly if you're a garden designer, why are you doing it? And I, I'd have no judgment about what people should decide. But once you've decided why you're doing it, that informs all your decisions from then on. Because every time you're asked to do something, you can check back and say, does that fit with why I'm doing this? So, for example, say you were doing it because you wanted to be a billionaire. Well, actually, that might decide you that you're in the wrong job. Anyway. <laughs> but it's a good, it's a good question to ask yourself. But also, if you decide that you want to do to do it because you want to heal the planet or help the earth, then when you're asked perhaps to do things which you don't think will forward um, that, you have that measurement against which to to measure. You know, I said this is why I'm doing it. Um, that's not working so my answer is to do things differently or if you're doing it to fit in with your life of bringing up children and then somebody says to you could you work 45 hours a week then you'll say well that's not why I'm doing it so I think the, the reason why um, is is a really good um, first question which leads into the second question the second tip sorry which is to set your boundaries and I think that is really important for all of us to set them before they are tested. I mean, so many of us get pushed about and jostled and, you know, we get our edges knocked off. And as we go along, we think, oh, I won't be doing that again. Or, oh, I must do something more like that. But if you actually have the space to sit down and think, these are my boundaries. And you can ask yourself questions. Would I or wouldn't I? It's one of those, you know scary questions you might ask late at night after a uh, long dinner or something but um so would i work for a bully would i use artificial grass would i work weekends would i work for friends would i um i don't know use pesticides um would i grow lavender they don't have to be um you know some of those things i've said I would do and some of them I wouldn't so I'm not again I'm not judging what people would and wouldn't do um, but I think we have to make our own boundaries because then when you're asked to do something again you have inside you ah oh, I promised myself this so you're kind of looking after you've got your higher self if you like is looking after you and so when these things come up you can think well those were the boundaries um, that I've set or, and you can do, or you can do it with your team. So we had a wonderful team day with uh, Elizabeth Cairns, who you know, and we went through quite a few things together. And it was a super process for all of us because it was a question of, right, well, this is what we're about. And once we decided what we're about, then we can measure all of these things against, against that. Um, my third tip um, is to surround yourself with um good energy mm. which really follows on from those other two as well and that good energy starts i think with yourself so make sure every day that you give yourself time and space and rest so that you can have good energy because we can all be depleted very easily it extends to who you work with so bringing in a team that's like-minded that isn't disrespectful, that um, is kind, that is respectful to clients, um, to the planet, all those sorts of things. Um, good fun as well. 
And that extends then to clients and to contractors and to suppliers, you know, and, and out and out it goes. And if you carry on thinking, um, is this good energy? Then you then you you feel it and you seek it. And also, I think you create it, you manifest it. So we, in our role as landscape architects, just a bit like as being as a linguist, we do a lot of listening and a lot of. Uh, listening beyond ears you know just trying to understand what, what's going on when somebody says to you what are they what are they really saying or when you're looking at the land what is the land really saying by the way it looks um and that really then it feeds back into is the energy good if it isn't how could we improve it how can we surround ourselves with good energy oh wonderful wonderful tips and yeah so important easier said than done sometimes some of them <laughs> like your why is just so important and it sounds like you've really got your sussed with your team so i'm sure that makes life a lot easier when you're approached to do specific work uh, it, it does it does help and i'm not saying we're perfect and as i said i'm not judging anybody else but it's no it's, no um yes i think it does help an awful lot because um, we're all navigating aren't we we're all navigating in this little life <laughs> absolutely and i love what you said about the energy as well so marion where can people find you online please uh, so i have a website uh, marionboswall.com and um, i'm on instagram which is at marion boswall or at marion boswall studio and uh, I, I'm sort of on Twitter, but very rarely. Um, I find it's not such good energy, actually, funnily enough. <laughs> and um, Facebook as well, just occasional waving, but mostly Instagram. Okay, great. And I'll put links to all of those and also your TED Talk in the show notes below. Thank you so much for your time and all your wisdom about, yeah, how we're looking after this planet of ours. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's so lovely to see you again. And you. Hopefully we'll bump into each other very, very soon. I hope so. Yes, that would be really nice. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. So I hope you enjoyed my interview with Marion. It was so lovely to catch up with her. And I am definitely going to be popping out to get some herbs for our garden and also working out how I can include some water in the garden as well. Um, we've got lots of wildlife that come into our garden to um, eat from the bird feeder and I'm sure they appreciate some water. So maybe you would consider adding some nature to your um, space, whether that's just a window box with, as she suggests, basil or some lavender. Um, yeah, just that little difference may make a big difference in the long run. So do give Marion a follow over on Instagram. I'm sure you'll fall in love with her images and the lovely um, reels that she shares and also the quotes that she shares as well. In the meantime, I will be back next Tuesday with another podcast and I look forward to seeing you then.